From the Kennan Institute in Washington, D.C., welcome to Kennan X, a podcast on our never-ending quest to understand Russia, Ukraine, and the surrounding region. I'm your host, Jill Doherty. So they broke into my apartment in the middle of the night. They took all my computers, cell phones, and also documents, also my passport. So they didn't want me to leave the country because I think that they understood that if I'm inside the country, under some investigation, it would be too dangerous for me to write something. But I still escaped from the country through the forest. That's Roman Dabrahodev, the brash founder of the Russian online internet magazine The Insider that specializes in investigative journalism. His story sounds dramatic, but it's not unique. Since Russia launched its war against Ukraine, and even before, as Vladimir Putin turned the screws on independent media, hundreds of journalists have fled their country. Many of them are living in the Baltic region, and that's where I traveled in May. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. I was attending two security conferences. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. But I really wanted to hear from these journalists who, many of them, felt threatened enough to gather their family together, pack their bags, and take off, by plane, by car, sometimes on foot, not knowing whether they will ever be able to return home. Over almost three weeks, I spoke with nine Russian journalists and one political activist who are now living in the Baltic countries. And over the next two episodes of Canon X, you'll hear their stories, how they view their work now that they're outside of Russia, and how they see Russia's future in this time of war. Well, officially we are registered in Riga, but this is just an official registration because Our journalists are working from Russia, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, Germany, Austria, France, Portugal, Britain, America, by the way, and almost all European and Western countries, we have at least one person. And this is actually very good for our understanding of what's going on. I spoke with Roman Dabrahotov in Tallinn at the Lennart Mary Security Conference, which I've been attending for several years. He says most of the 25 staff of the Insider used to be in Russia. Now most of them are outside of Russia. But the Insider's problems didn't begin just with Putin's war against Ukraine, he says. It started actually before the war. It started last spring. And now I understand that This war against journalism that Putin started a year ago, arresting journalists and labeling them foreign agents or undesirable organizations. And when FSB were making searches of journalist apartments, all of it was preparation for war in Ukraine. At that moment, we didn't understand this. But if you look at this in perspective, you see that actually it is pretty logical that he brought some troops to Ukrainian border a year ago in the beginning of the year. And then suddenly he returned his troops back. And now if you ask yourself, why would he do this? Why he didn't start the war last spring? So for me, the logical explanation is that because of political turmoil that was inside the country and because when Alexei Navalny returned to Russia, there were very big protests and there were very big investigations of investigative journalists, including us. So we published investigations of poisoning Alexei Navalny and identified all the FSB agents who participated in the poisoning. Mm. But also there were other investigations of our colleagues about Putin's daughters, legal and unofficial daughters. And there was an investigation by Navalny himself about Putin's palace in Sochi. So Putin understood that he has no resources both to control situation inside and waging a war in the same time. So he returned troops back and in several months we saw a very, very tough suppression of all the alternative voices inside the country, including activists and journalists. There were were hundreds of criminal cases against activists, and most of them have to leave Russia. Those who didn't leave are now imprisoned. I mean, those who work, especially with Alexei Navalny. You know, Russia is still considered a pretty closed place, and especially the subjects that you touch. Again, talking about Putin's daughters and things like that. Maybe even you can give us some hints about Putin's health. (laughs) But how do you do that? How do you possibly... Well, first of all, I remember that like a year ago when I was still living in Russia and when I was visiting some countries, including like America, people were so surprised that you 
could live inside the country and make journalism like this because they were absolutely sure that Russia is already like North Korea and there is nothing inside this. But no, it was till last summer, it was a country full of journalists, including investigative journalists who were brave enough to publish whatever they want. And I would even claim that Russian investigative journalism of last years is still now and was in the last years the most effective and most prospering journalism in all over the world, actually, including even America, because I know, of course, there are big corporations like New York Times, Washington Post and others who provide sometimes brilliant investigations. But still, if you see the scale of investigations in Russia, the topics like in what country and what time you would have also investigation how your president tried to kill the main oppositioner with chemical weapon and you discover all the people who stood behind it super success but also to have the success you need to have such kind of regime so it's like newton's law the more strong they become the more interesting our stories also mm -hmm. become because we have some dictators and there are murders to write about and also because of this toxic environment, only those journalists survived in Russia who were effective and strong enough to get used to this new reality. So, yeah, I think this evolution brought us to the situation where we have a bunch of so like seven, eight small investigative media that are very experienced and that are new school journalists. Dabrohotev says he began as an old-school journalist in 2005, but now there's a new type of journalism. A journalist, especially investigative journalist, at that time was a person who just has a lot of sources, contacts. He also drinks a lot because <laughs> how else you can get some information from your partners and friends. So uh, usually there are very miserable people because their job was just to speaking, talking with lots of people, going to different regions. And if you saw how this investigative journalists uh, are presented in Hollywood movies, this is usually like people who don't comb their hair and very poor dressed and they're always drunk, miserable people. This is not a real, of course, picture because they're all very different. But still, there was a problem that big media corporations at that time thought that Investigative journalism is declining. It's so expensive. We have to cut our budgets. We can't afford the person who write one article per month or even per two months. People will click to other stories. Well, they will click gifts with kittens, not uh, an investigative story about corruption. So that was the atmosphere at that time. And now we have totally new journalism. So now investigative journalists are bunch of young people with laptops who don't have a lot of sources or no sources at all, but who can use open sources intelligence, who can understand how databases work, who can navigate in black market of data, especially it's relevant for Russia, where we have all the kind of data about each person. Everything you do is in some police database, and that's why you can penetrate this database. And for 10 bucks by everything about everyone, including FSB agents. So this appeared to be the best time to be investigative journalism in Russia because lots of things coincided. So first of all, we have very high demand on investigative journalism because the government is very closed and we don't have a lot of information about what they are doing. Again, our government is committing such awful crimes like poisoning journalists and waging wars, stealing everything they see, etc., etc. So there are lots of bright, interesting stories you can write about. The third factor is that, again, we have enormous ocean of information that is both in open sources and in databases. In open sources, it is because in ERA, everyone has social networks, everyone uses cell phone, everyone, well, I don't know, flies a plane or buy tickets to train in internet. So everyone has digital trace. I don't know any person, even Putin has digital trace because he's flying on special governmental planes and you can trace these planes to where Putin is flying. I like this job also because the first book that I read was Sherlock Holmes. And I like the idea that just a clever man with a pipe, I also smoke pipe, by the way, because of Sherlock Holmes, a clever man with a pipe can just sitting in his room solve some crimes and some puzzles because he has some methods, can analyze information. And because of this, understand who was murdered. 
And what we are doing now is really a little bit the same because actually everybody has the access to these tools. Everybody can use them, but not everybody becomes an investigator journalist because it needs some skills of analyzing this. So we have a lot of competitors in this market, but I think that we are the inside and the Bellingcat, our partners on the main investigations on Russia, we possibly just analyze this data a little bit better than others. And this is kind of an intellectual game. So it's both important for our country, but it's also very entertaining for ourselves. So I'm really enjoying this, analyzing itself. And of course, the stories are very interesting. It's like you can't watch HBO or Netflix series anymore. They're boring <laughs> because you see, I'd better go to work because their stories are much more interesting and much more realistic. How is the war in Ukraine affecting your work now? So, of course, the war in Ukraine is the most important topic for us. Our audience tripled after, actually, the growth was 10 times, but our website was blocked after the war. So now I think our audience is three times bigger than it used to be hmm. before the war because people use VPNs. So the demand is very high. The demand for information in Russia is very, very high. People want to know about the war. People want to know about the future of Russia economy after sanctions. And people just want to understand what's going on. So many of them were living just normal lives and many of them didn't want to have any interest in politics. Now they understand that this is impossible anymore, that like you need to understand what is all it about. And we're trying to explain this. We're doing not only investigations, we have opinion columns with experts who are explaining in simple words what's going on. We have explainers, including video explainers in YouTube that also help to navigate in this information space. We have also debunking of fake news. So we have special monitoring department who analyze the information and then debunk the fakes. Obviously, the media in Russia are filled with state propaganda 24-7. Mm -hmm. But how big is the appetite, would you say, among average people for information about this? Not just people in Moscow, but people in smaller towns. Well, there can be different answers on this question. Well, first of all, the saying that appetite comes while eating. So you need to have a little bit to taste, to bite a bit, something to understand that you need it and you want it, at least to see it. So when people bump into information about genocide in Bucha, for example, they understand that they need to read more about this, at least to have some information about this. So I think that I don't know what can we call average Russians because average is a word can be understood in different meanings. If we speak about average in sense of People who live in regions and are not super educated, but I don't know, also want to know something about what's going on. So among these average people, I think the demand on information is very high. But we also have a bubble of people. I would say it's somewhere between 20 and 30 percent who are very loyal to the government. Most of them are elder people from the region. And they are really zombies. So when you speak with these people, they sound like people from some malicious sect who can't even question their ideas. I'll give you some examples. It's not one example. There are lots of them, and I witnessed some of them personally. When a woman in Ukraine sitting in a shelter calling her mother in Crimea and saying that we are being bombed, mother answers, you are lying to me. That is false. You are brainwashed. Please don't call me again. There are so many examples like this. Yeah. And at first I thought that, well, that must be some really stupid people, but this is like a massive phenomenon. So almost like a cult. It has features of a real cult because you have a figure in the center that is sacred and that is super important because you get your system of values from this figure directly from, I don't know, some speeches or indirectly through this system that is through propagandists from TV. They explain the thoughts of this figure and you identify yourself with this figure, with this community of these people. It was famous saying of Valodin, who used to be speaker of the parliament. I don't know who is he now, possibly still speaker of the parliament, but I don't know. He's United Russia leader. So he said that if there is Putin, there is Russia. If there is no Putin, there is no Russia. And this is the idea of these people. So they identify themselves with Putin. And it is for them, every failure of Putin is also their failure. So it's very difficult for them 
to admit that for 20 years they were deceived, that they were brainwashed, that uh, all the expectations were wrong. So we don't try to persuade these people because we understand that this is not our job. This is job for like psychiatrists or I don't know, for people who are understanding rehabilitation. We are working for other 70 plus percent of Russians, which is more than enough. Let me ask you just about journalism in general, because you do have enormous numbers of journalists out of the country now. Yeah. Some of them left a while ago, like Medusa left a while ago. But right now they're scattered all over the place. People who are Russian, speaking Russian, writing in Russian. So how does this phenomenon change Russian journalism? I mean, are you still part of the conversation, part of journalism back in Russia? I think it's interesting to compare what happened with exiled Russians and exiled Belarusians because it's very different. Because in Belarus, tough repression started earlier, so we already have hundreds or possibly thousands of Belarusians living in Europe for years in other European countries. We can notice that their efforts are mostly directed to Europe, to West. They're lobbying something, I don't know, in Washington, in Brussels, lobbying for some sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, because they're not leaving Belarusian agenda, most of them. Some of them do, but most of them not. In Russia, it's very different. Russia is very big and Russian discourse is very important for Russia. So they leave Russia without leaving Russia in their mind. So if you look into our Twitter feed and our Facebook feed, you will see that We are still speaking about what's happening in Russia, what's the main problems there, main conflicts. And we know what is the weather there, what is the prices, and what is closed, what is open, blah, blah, blah. It's because possibly it will change at some point in some years. But for now, it is looking at some Russians coming to Riga or Vilnius or some, many of them in Tbilisi. These are beautiful countries, but this no one would switch to, I don't know, Georgian politics in Tbilisi or mm-hmm. Latvian politics. But in Russia, everything is now changing and all of our thoughts is about Russia and Ukraine now. Also at the Lenart Mary conference in Tallinn, I spoke with Anton Barbashin, co-founder and editorial director at Riddle Russia, which he describes as an online think tank that publishes in Russian and in English. It launched in cooperation with a Polish think tank in 2015, and then independently in Vilnius, Lithuania in 2018, where he and his wife now live. A lot of journalists have left. And I'm very interested in what happens when they leave Russia. I'm thinking, for instance, if you go back to 1917, you had people who fled Russia and they created publications in Europe and in the United States. There was a very famous one, Nova Ruska Slova. But what happens now? Because some people will leave forever, but I know a lot would like to go back. But until they do... Are they part of the debate of journalism in Russia? I don't think old rules apply anymore. Because of technology, Mm -hmm. we are able to stay in touch with the reality of things in Russia on a daily matter. I mean, for some journalists, and not only journalists, we're talking about kind of broader definition here, analysts and people who just engage in public debates on all things Russian they have the capacity to basically be on their laptop, working, communicating with people, analyzing information live, wherever they are. They could be in Tver, they could be in Thailand, they could be in Prague or London. It doesn't really matter. It's whether they decide they want to spend time to be there informationally. And I know a lot of people, and especially now, people that are based in some of the European capitals, informational, they remain in Russia, they remain engaged. So I don't think it is a problem. Honestly speaking, I actually think in the future to come, in the months to come, there would be more demand for people who are physically out of Russia. Thus, they are not bound by Russian limitations. They Mm. could analyze information as fully as they need. They could call things what they are and address Russian audiences. And Russian audiences will be finding new ways to receive that information, whether it's VPNs or other services, or there's YouTube videos, or some other technical means. But technology here actually saves immigration because you don't have to immigrate in terms of how you are engaged with Russian audiences. It is a choice. You don't have to do it. A really good point. It kind of leads into another question, which is the Russian audience still back in Russia. 
they're accepting you? I mean, are you considered part of their sources of information? Or is there any level where they say, you left, you don't really understand Russia anymore? Well, I don't know what's the particular case with like Riddle Russia, because we are kind of a more niche outlet. But when we're talking about Medusa, for instance, mm. at some point, people no longer care whether they're based in Riga. They write in Russian, they understand Russia, they report in Russia, and that's what matters. So I think it is you know, a case-by-case case situation where some people who left Russia and they position themselves as I'm now in immigration and that's my offer to you guys and that's my view. And they could be taking as someone, you know, immigration and some people who just work, work remotely could be absolutely part of the conversation. I mean, most of the most say important public figures and public intellectuals are now out of Russia. And I think they will still remain the conversation. The question is how in touch with the reality on the ground they would be. And from 14 to 22, we had many years proving that it is still possible. For as long as there's internet access, you have your Telegram channels, you have people you can talk to, you can Zoom, Skype, use all that technology, it is still possible. Mm -hmm. Does it change your perspective? I mean, actually, you do have a lot of different people with different perspectives, but does it change your, let's call it publication or your site's view that you are located outside? Look, I think the line here is if you are making a political statement, then it gets a little bit more tricky. As analysts, we just analyze information. We kind of use various models to look at the data we have. And for that matter, again, you could be in Twitter, you could be in anywhere, and you will have pretty much the same outlook for the situation. But if you propose something in terms of like a policy or a political statement, then it kind of gets tricky as most of the people inside the country could be very skeptical of political claims or demands even that come from Russians from the outside. Like, hey, why don't you do more, for instance? I mean, that's what we hear a lot happening recently. And that could be problematic. But again, if we're talking about reporting, analysis, these type of things, I don't think it matters all that much. Yeah. I follow you all the time on Twitter. Thank you. And I am quite amazed by how much tweeting you do. Like, it must be constant all day long. But it's interesting because you have a very edgy approach. Your English is perfect. You express yourself really, really well. And yet, you come from this, what I would call, intellectual world. You thought you said it's a think tank, really. How do you put those two things together? Well, honestly speaking, since the war began, tweeting was a little bit like therapy. Wanting some ideas, just seeing... And I think it is especially important to Russians out there abroad just to communicate some of the ideas and thoughts we have about what's going on and how we feel about it. So I not only tweet like analysis, but some kind of personal ideas, sometimes maybe a little bit of joking here and there. And it's just a tool to stay sane in this environment. And plus, this type of engagement helps me promote articles we publish with Riddle. And the end goal here is just to show people, look, just here's my analysis on this question and here's an article I recommend you to read. And bigger audience helps, great engagement helps, more people looking at Riddle helps our own authors and their analysis and helps the community at large. Anton Barbashin comes from Novosibirsk in Siberia, where he studied international relations. He spent a year and a half in Moscow, and in 2014, he and his wife Olga wanted to launch their own platform. It was right before the annexation of Crimea, we thought of being outsiders in Moscow. It was a problem to find a network or a platform where we could speak our minds and especially being young folk from the regions, we had this Moscow, I would say distrust, but Moscow could be well, not very welcoming at times. So you have to be like either legacy or you have to have ties. We didn't have any of that. So we wanted to launch our own platform, but already at the time it was problematic because some of the Russian laws that were introduced. Mm -hmm. Then we found a possibility to launch what eventually became Riddle from out of Poland as intersection project, and we relocated. but. At the time, we did not consider ourselves like political immigrants or anything like that. It was more of just working remotely. That was the key point. We continued to travel to Russia every three, four months, maybe half a year, staying in touch with everything back at home. Well, since then, it's been quite a few years now, but 
The last time we visited it was in January, so just a few weeks before the war. I was in Moscow at the beginning of the February 24th invasion of Ukraine, and there was a definite feeling of increasing societal unrest. At the conference in Tallinn in May, several Russians I talked with told me they are convinced there will be a revolution in Russia. Among them is Roman Dabrahodov. To make a revolution in Russia, we need several million people, which is several percent of the most active people. But these people are now too afraid and they will go to protest and they will change the system only when they feel they have a chance. So it's like game theory. No one wants to be the first, but they understand that they will all lose if there is no protest. So at some point, there must be a point when some brave people started or some desperate people losing their jobs who have nothing to feed their families, etc., etc., and they going first and then other people have said, well, now we have a chance. I don't think that we can now predict when it happens in Russia and how it happens in Russia. But history teaches us that it always happened in such kind of the situation when there is both moral bankruptcy of some ideology and at the same time, a tough economic crisis. Mm-hmm. So now we see both of these factors. So people don't believe in this ideology or the system. I mean, the majority of people, not everyone, but majority of people don't believe. And also we see more and more economic consequences because of the war. So at some point that must explode. And I can't predict will it be this year, later, but at some point that is inevitable. But certainly not all Russian journalists now living abroad agree. Anton Barvashin thinks there must be a revolution in how Russians think. A lot of people in Russia already understand that there is no going further with Putin for Russia. And Putin started this war. He and a very small group of people made the call. We can speak about collective responsibility of Russian society. That's all there. But there is a group of people that are actually guilty. And they are stopping Russia from going further. This would be evident for a greater number of people in Russia soon. But this is the message that the West could continue repeating that, look, There's no going back to anything we had before. It was problematic anyway. But here and now you have this problem with the political leadership that led to this horrible war and destroyed Ukraine and is destroying Russia. But if that is done with, if, you know, you can reconcile for what is happening in Ukraine, we could start some proper conversation. If Russia can part with this imperial past actively, not just on the display and not as it was presumed it was done with in the 90s, then we could have a proper conversation of how we can live together. But I would expect for the West to be creative about to propose a vision of what Russia is, a good Russia is, or a Russia the West can live with, because it is a big problem. A lot of open-minded Russians want to see Russia part of, we don't have to call it West still, we don't have to call it like European Union, whatever. I mean, we could call it Global North, whatever. Just in a good, decent relationship with good economic cooperation, open borders, so on and so forth. The open society, right? But what it would cost? What would be the terms? There are a lot of very hard questions there that needs to be answered. I know there's a lot to do for the Russian side, but even at this point, it cannot be just like, is the list of 25 things you need to do, and then we can start talking. Mm. I mean, it would be great to have some proposal on the table, even if it's never realized. It's just that thinking long-term, Russian political figures, whether it's opposition from within, there's from the outside, that they could propose a vision to the Russians that, look, if we part with Putin and his legacy, there's this that we could aspire to. But there is this idea that certainly Putin has, which is Russia is different. It's not like just some old European country. But could Russia ever be just kind of a normal country? It's a question of definitions. But I think what is important that Russia is a European empire that instead of parting with its past, went through a phase of the Soviet Union, which raised it to a new hyper level that blocked the entire conversation, blocked even the creation of a definition apparatus of what Russia was in terms of kind of its imperial legacy and barred Russians from honest discussion of what constitutes Russia, where Russia ends. I mean, you remember this Putin's famous quote that Russian borders never end, yeah. Yeah. but it's bogus. What we're seeing now essentially is the continued collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. 
Putin not giving Ukraine, not allowing it to be a nation of its own. It's not about NATO, about anything. It's just Russians not being able to part with this empire. And that is going to happen one way or another. But it is better to have, in my understanding, not a promise, but some kind of beacon of hope, essentially, that if you do, then we don't have anything specifically against you because you are Russian on a genetic level. Because we are actually seeing it now on a daily basis in Russia. The government is essentially scaring Russians that, look, if we lose now, you're going to be treated as second-class citizens. This is the danger. Yes, yes. and exactly. people are afraid that because of what Russian government did and because they did not act, they did not prevent it from happening in Ukraine, mm. Russians are going to be treated as second-class people, as how Russian TV is now treating Ukraine. Mm. But this is a real fear that is being exploited heavily. Mm. And some of the responses that are organically happening in EU and US now I think that you've mentioned today are reasonably and not without substance are scaring Russians. Yeah. They are afraid that this is going to be happening and this red passport is going to be like a black mark exactly. for them and their kids. Yeah. We know that it is a very emotional moment and some of those responses might not be thought through in terms of long term. And it's very hard for a lot of policymakers. It's very hard for European and American policymakers to think long-term and propose this long-term vision now when you have this gruesome suffering happening in Ukraine. It's almost impolite to even speak about Russia's future while Ukraine is suffering, but I have to kind of urge if that is possible to consider because, very important point, Russia would never be conquered militarily because of the nukes. There's not going to be like an occupation force that could de-Putinize Russia. So it will still have to deal with its own problems. But again, we've had this experience already before that if Russia is left alone and is not given a hand, it might go down on a very bad path. Yeah. And I think, honestly speaking, if we're rational about it, it is not in the interest of the US or the EU or Russia itself to let Russia run loose and walk in the path of disintegration that could create ripple effects all over Eurasia that are much worse than what we're seeing now in Ukraine. And finally, do these young Russian journalists plan to return home someday? I'm one of those who finds it impossible to cut ties. I know quite a few people were able to do that, but I do not wish to. And I don't think it's for them to decide. I am still kind of optimistic in terms of long term. At least in terms of opportunities and possibilities, they would at least emerge. And by that time, I hope our analytical infrastructure would be even stronger and we could use this capacity to bring it home and try to do something there. Yeah, well, we all, I mean, all of my friends, relatives, uh, colleagues, we all, of course, understand that at some point we return. Possibly it will be soon if the revolution starts in a year. But we need to prepare ourselves that sometimes exile maybe for long and we need to be ready for that but of course still we think that we will return at some point and i hope that it will be soon i heard more of these discussions and debates about the war about journalism and mostly about russia itself as i moved on from tallinn to riga latvia and then to vilnius lithuania and that's what you'll hear in our next episode of kenan x If you're looking for other podcasts that dispel the stereotypes and myths about Russia, here are two for you. The SRB podcast has weekly interviews on everything from Russian punk rock to Putin. You can also tune in to Teddy Goes to the USSR, a six-part series looking at the Soviet Union through an American tourist's eyes. Both available wherever you get your podcasts. Kenan X is a product of the Kenan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. It's the Wilson Center's oldest program, founded in 1974 by George F. Kennan, American statesman, James Billington, historian and former Librarian of Congress, and historian S. Frederick Starr. Inspired by them, the Kennan Institute's mission is to improve America's understanding of Russia and the wider region. Thanks for listening.